Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the cheap underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGB Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now here's your host, David Hinojosa. Welcome to another edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host this week, David Hinojosa, and today I'm talking with Julian Guthrie on her new book, How to Make a Spaceship, A Band of Renegades, An Epic Race, and the Birth of Private Spaceflight. Julian Guthrie is an award-winning journalist who spent 20 years at the San Francisco Chronicle and has been published by the Wall Street Journal, Time, The Washington Post, and others. She's the author of The Billionaire and the Mechanic, a best-selling account of Oracle CEO Larry Ellison's pursuit of the America's Cup, and of The Grace and of Everyday Saints, the story of the longest parish protest in Catholic America. Julian, welcome to the program. Thank you. Great to be with you. So, first and foremost, I uh, I want to say, wow, what a book! I it really kept me on the edge of my seat the entire time I read it. I found your book, How to Make a Spaceship, very exciting and thrilling from cover to cover. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. That means so much to me. Thank you. I like I like at the edge of your seat. You know, it's like there were so many of these harrowing test flights when I was writing about them. I felt the same <laughs> way. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it was very thrilling. It was very exciting. Uh, there was never a dull moment in reading the book. So um, There's a lot there. Uh, There's a lot there, definitely. A lot of adventure, a lot of heart, a lot of... Um, big dreams, you know, a lot of uh, roadblocks and uh, a lot of persistence. Absolutely. All the things I love in a story. Great technological, you know, innovation as well. But, oh, absolutely. But great human qualities. Yes. Uh, I, I like to begin by asking you about your research because I read that as part of, part of your research for this book, you had to travel to Florida, the Mojave Desert, St. Louis, Seattle. You were all over the U.S., and um, I wanted to ask, which trip provided the most insight? Um, probably my multiple trips to the Mojave Desert. Actually, two things. So um, the Mojave Desert, which is a unique place, uh, I spent a lot of time there. I kept going back and back and back and interviewing, you know, the test pilots, uh, Mike Melville and Brian Benny and and then I went up to Idaho and interviewed Bert Rattan. But I really wanted to see this, you know, in the Mojave Desert in Southern California, which is just two hours um, uh, east of uh, Los Angeles. You know, it's really this off-the-grid place where you can, you know, build and fly these crazy experimental uh, machines. And I want it's the, the spirit of the Wild West and... Um, great, amazing, innovative things are happening there. So that was really fascinating. Um, and that was very, very telling just in terms of understanding um, rocket scientists, rocketry, test pilots, that maverick spirit, you know, the sense of the Wild West that anything is possible and not too much governmental oversight, regulation. Um, so all of that comes together in a very important way in the story. And then um, you know, one of the most important things I did was, which didn't require me to leave anywhere, was Peter Diamand is the main character of my book, at the heart of the story. I wasn't getting a sense of who he was enough, and I kept going back to him and asking more and more questions, and he finally unearthed 30, well, 25 years worth of his personal um, private journals, and they were in storage storage locker, and nobody has read these, and he unredacted, un, you know, he didn't even look at them, he sent them all to me. And I spent a full month reading these journals, and they were so important to my research. And I literally spent a month, and I had like a thousand little post-it notes in the pages, where I'm reading about this boy become a man, and all of his dreams of, of space and technology, and I'm reading this, and then the hardship, too, um, you know, where he has early success and he goes to MIT and he goes to Harvard and he launches student space clubs and his dreams are just to get to space. And I'm reading this and you're rooting for him. 
And so that was very, very important. And you and I read as he launches this incentive competition, this X Prize, and so that was a big part of my research. Actually, that was a breakthrough part. But I also did go to St. Louis. I wanted to see where you know, Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh had found his backers, and I went to Seattle and met with his grandson, Eric Lindbergh, all big fixtures in the book. Um, I went to Florida and actually met with Peter's family there and others. So I did a lot of travel, and I just did exhaustive research, at times very exhausting. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, it it does come through uh, in the book. That's why I wanted to ask you about your your research process. And, and I wanted to ask you, were there any challenges that you encountered during your research process? I think it was understanding and um, not being a space geek or a rocket scientist myself. It was, and I say space geek in a, in a positive way because it involves a lot of passion. It was really the, um, it was a few things. It was um, the history of the space industry really understanding that. It was the history of aviation because early aviation, obviously all the milestones led to the milestones in space. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was these people, you know, I had a handful of people who were um, not, you know, we had the protagonist, Peter Diamandis, but then we had this supporting cast and they are big personalities and they are big, you know, have big accomplishments. And so it was really, you know, learning. It was as if I were writing a, you know, short biography on each of these people. So I had to learn so much about all of them and then weave their stories together. Um, So it was the rocket science. It was aviation history. It was space history. But then it was the individual stories and getting all of that right, um, which, you know, it was very, very challenging. And I'm just so proud that uh, of the story that I got to tell and and uh, I love the new paperback out today. I think it's really beautiful. And, and I have, uh, yeah, some great, um, amazing people who contributed the forward and the afterward. And so I was as deeply humbled by Richard Branson's contribution and Professor Stephen Hawking's afterward. Yes. It was an arduous journey for the author, uh, but not nearly as much as it was for... Um, those involved, right? The main character of my story, Peter mm-hmm. Diamandis, and those who made this, you know, this a reality, private space flight. You know, what a cool thing. What an impossible dream. And now it's actually happening. It is happening. Um, to to those of you that, who may not know, could you please tell us uh, a little bit what the X Prize entails? Yes. Yeah, so Peter Diamandis, mm-hmm. um, you know, was eight years old when he watches Apollo 11 uh, land on the moon in July 1969, and that's what starts him on this journey. He wants to get to space, and he does all of these things, thinking he can, you know, get to space, become an astronaut. He realizes NASA isn't going to be the one to take him there, so he's reading The Spirit of St. Louis by Charles Lindbergh, and he has this aha moment where Lindbergh flew in 1927 from New York to Paris to win a $25,000 prize. Mm-hmm. He didn't fly as a stunt. And so Peter thinks, what if I could use an incentive competition, um, $10 million for the first team, private, non-governmental, that can build and fly a rocket to the start of space? Mm-hmm. And that was the first X Prize. And he called it the X Prize because he was going to fill in, eventually fill in the name. You know, it would be like a Pulitzer, it would be a, um, there, there would be a benefactor. But um, it took him a long time to find his benefactor, which is a part of this, you know, entrepreneurial adventure mm-hmm. story. Um, so that's how the X Prize started with this first space prize. Today, the X Prize Foundation, which is based in Los Angeles, is a global uh, nonprofit which uses again these incentive competitions with these big prizes to solve some of the world's biggest problems. A very cool one going on right now is the Google Lunar X Prize, where mm-hmm. it comes right out of the story of my book. Um, in that Peter had this idea back in 2000 of a private race to the moon, and so that's happening right now. Thirty million dollars has been offered by Google, and there are several teams that have registered to um, to launch this year, 2017. So we'll either see that at the end of this year or early next year, 2018, where we'll have you know privately launched. Uh, and we'll have rovers, you know, landing on the moon, and and at least that's the goal, and sending images back from the moon. So, mm-hmm. 
pretty amazing. It is pretty amazing. And, and I also learned that the X Prize diversified into um, education and env- environmental uh, milestones and, and research and all of that. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, so the X Prize um, has now competitions, and they've awarded you know hundreds, hundred plus million um, dollars in prizes for everything from you know innovators who can come up with a new way, say for ocean oil cleanup, to um, they have a handheld tricorder um, health diagnostic um, device. They you can, you know, check them out, uh, Google them, you know, X Prize, and there's a list of all of their prizes. They're, they're global, and it's a really amazing model to spur innovation. Um, and it, you really get, as I tell in my book, you really get these off-the-grid types. You get these people who don't necessarily work for the big companies who come up with the best solutions. You get these private citizens, you know, working, you know, as mavericks in a place like the Mojave Desert. Um so, you know, that's that's what it started with. It started in 1996 with this dream of private space, and then it's branched out today, as you referenced, into all of these other um, incentive competitions. But again, to solve big challenges, you mm-hmm. know, what's your moonshot? What's your big dream? What needs solving? And ask those questions. Yes. Now, uh, going back to, you know, the, the found the you talked about how the X Prize. Uh, came about, but I, I want to know how, I read how the book came about, and you were doing a story for the uh, San Francisco Chronicle. Was was it the story, was the story about the X Prize, or was it a different story when you talked to Peter, and uh, how did that come about? Yes, I was at the San Francisco Chronicle, where I worked for 20 years, hard to believe, mm-hmm. and I did a, a front page profile, <clears throat> excuse me, on Peter Diamandis. And I was doing these profiles on interesting people in our mix in the Bay Area, and he has a university called Singularity University that he co-founded up in Silicon Valley. And I thought it'd be so interesting to profile him, and I did, and we started talking about the founding of the X Prize, and I didn't really know that much about this story that I tell in my book. And and I had finished my book on Larry Ellison and his quest for the America's Cup, and I was kind of fishing around for um, for my next great story, what I hoped would be my next great story. And I was like, wow, I love this story so much. So I started to research it more, and Peter was like, well, I've been, you know, I really have wanted to find the right writer for 10 plus years, and uh, so maybe we can work together. So we both did our research and kept talking, and, and I just loved it. I loved uh, Peter as a character, um, you know, and his, his journey, and it's full of, you know, failure and accomplishments and more failure and persistence and um, real innovative thinking. And then I love the others who come into play, you know, the Eric Lindberghs and the Burt Rattan and mm-hmm. This extraordinary woman, Anusha Ansari, whose whose story in this is just great, and I love it that a woman comes in at the end and helps rescue things. Um, yes. So all of these characters and their dreams and how they made uh, the impossible possible, and um, I was just drawn to it. I was drawn to the test pilots, and I was drawn to the you know the, there are some great love stories within, and there's a story of finding redemption and. Mm-hmm. And then just history. You know, this was a chapter in history that um, needed to be immortalized, and it was so it's so relevant today. You know, it's so relevant to what is going on, whether in the space industry or just you know big dreams, finding breakthroughs. Um, so that's that's what those are the things that drew me into it. Mm-hmm. And who was the person who impacted you the most during your interview? I think um, that's a great question. Um, well, Peter did, just his spirit of never giving up um, and this whole, you know, quote-unquote moonshot thinking, you know, where you're trying to do something impossible, and again, you don't give up on that. I think, in a, you know, in a, I mean, Peter's vision is amazing and his story is amazing, and he's incredible as a human being. Um, Peter Diamandis, you can check him out online. and. Um, 
very inspiring. But in a in another way, you know, I was very touched by the the test pilot story. You know, these these in these two cases, these men who um, you know loved piloting experimental planes, and again, they're straight out of the right stuff, and um, and they're very different pilots. But I got to tell their stories, and I really love the story. Well, two stories, but one story of Mike Melville, um, who was a high school dropout in South Africa and came to the United States with his wife and his young wife, and they eventually find their way to the Mojave Desert, and he takes up piloting only in his 30s, and he goes on to become the world's first commercial astronaut. And his story is remarkable, and his love story with his wife and you know, it's it's tough to be the wife of a test pilot, and I think I got to tell that story, um, you know, and I just find them remarkable. And then Eric Lindbergh's, you know, journey of hitting rock bottom mm-hmm. with rheumatoid arthritis and then finding his way back and figuring out how he could embrace the Lindbergh legacy without... Um, with, you know, with, with his own, making his own statement about what it was. So, you know, it's, um, I, I really, really, as you can tell, I, it's hard for me to pick one. Mm-hmm. There, there are great stories. And then Bert Rattan, you know, is a very unique, wonderful, larger than life figure. I think he jumps off the pages in some way, big, bold personality, you know, who his eyes light up, you know, like the eyes of a child mm-hmm. when he talks about planes and flying. And he's a guy who can't, if a plane is flying overhead, he can't help but look up and identify it. And, you know, he's a maverick and he's a legend. And he now has six or seven of his own designs in the Smithsonian, including this little, you know, home-built spaceship, uh, Spaceship One, that I got to write about. So um, that's hanging in the Milestones of Flight Gallery next to the Spirit of St. Louis. Uh, mm-hmm. Big dreams and then figuring out how to make your your dreams a reality. Yeah, I, I when I read that, I was so... Uh, you know, taken away, you know, the, about Bert Rutan and um, every single character in, in this book. I mean, these aren't fictional characters, they're real people, and they just seem, you know, just amazing. They're just, they did great things. And I have to ask, how was it to fly along with Mike Melville, the first commercial astronaut? Because I, I read you, oh, you got that? to fly with him, and uh, not many people have had that privilege. I know, I know, that's great you picked up on that. There are a few park perks of the job. When I was writing the book about Larry Ellison and the America's Cup, I got to sail out on San Francisco Bay uh, with Jimmy Spithill, the great skipper on one of those, you know, enormous uh, America's Cup boats. And with this, when I was in the Mojave, I got to go to Tehachapi, a little mountainous town near Mojave, where Mike um, and his wife have uh, their little plane, a uh, Um, a home-built plane called a Long Easy, a two-seater, and Mike took me out flying in that. And uh, it was very, it was it was quite memorable because we're flying, you know, over Mojave and over the hills of Tehachapi in this, you know, home-built plane, this plane that he built with his own hands. And Mm -hmm. he decided he needed to have me experience some of the thrills of, of flying in a small plane and goes about doing, you know, loops and rolls and and then actually has me fly the plane for just a you know short period of time but you know mike is i think probably most at home in the air and he's a guy that um i would trust anywhere and so that was a thrill you know that was that was that was uh that was great I mean, just an incredible human being and i love his story within the story yeah, and, and it comes forth in the book. I mean, uh, just reading about it, it was just an amazing thing. Um, I, I have to ask, is there anyone that you would have liked to interview but didn't get a chance to for this book? Yes. Yeah, so while I have these great fly-on-the-wall scenes with Elon Musk, whom I did interview, and uh, Richard Branson when they're first starting to think about getting into space, um, Jeff Bezos, who's the founder of Amazon and now has the space company Blue Origin. So he was the chapter head um, at Princeton of this space club that Peter Diamandis founded. Peter founded it. It's called SEDS, S-E-D-S, while he was at MIT. And, and again, so Jeff was um, you know, in a space club in at Princeton, And uh, I really wanted to interview 
Jeff and didn't get a chance to, unfortunately. But he's just doing remarkable things uh, right now and using his money, from, you know, made from Amazon and, uh, you know, building up his private space company. And that was something, there's a scene in the book where he's meeting with Peter in Seattle and, you know, Peter's trying to get him to invest in the X Prize or to fund the X Prize, the $10 million prize. And Jeff, you know, declines, but mm-hmm. he said he, you know, when he makes enough money on this new company called Amazon, uh, he's going to start a space company. So, mm-hmm. um, so he was one who, it was a very good question, who I didn't get an interview, I would have loved to, and is clearly, you know, the one of the great innovators uh, of the world. And I wanted to mention that, uh, and you may be interested in this, David, I would love to have you contribute. We're running a campaign on Facebook. You can go to Facebook and search How to Make a Spaceship Book. We're asking people to share their moonshots, their crazy dreams, and uh, we're giving away copies uh, of the book signed by none other than Sir Richard Branson and oh, wow. Peter Diamandis and myself. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, a really neat thing, and to create this community around, you know, big thinkers and big dreamers and and um, all of the themes that are, that are alive and well uh, in the book and for all of those out there who are listening who may have a big dream and want to share it and maybe get a copy of the book signed by Richard Branson. That's great. That's great. I would love to. Uh, contribute to that. Um, I have a Would couple- you? Good. Yes, okay, I'll, absolutely. I'll follow up and say, yes. It's just, yeah, search Facebook, How to Make a Spaceship book page. Sounds good. I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. Um, I, I have a couple more questions. Uh, if you had the opportunity to travel to space with one of the people you interviewed in this book, who would you go with? Oh, my gosh. What a fantastic question. Um, really, I can only choose one. Yes. <laughs> Only choose one. Okay. Well, I think it would have to be the ultimate space dreamer, my friend Peter Diamandis, only because, you know, I feel like I watched him grow up um, by reading all of those journals, and I know that that wide-eyed little boy um, who sat in front of the black and white TV and listened to Walter, Walter Cronkite, Cronkite narrate, you know, the... Mm-hmm. Uh, first steps on another celestial planet. That little boy, I'd love to see his expression um, as a grown man. So, and knowing, you know, all that he put into that dream, um, what it would mean to him, I think that that would be really uh, unforgettable. Mm-hmm. So he, he has some. Although there are many to... others who would be great company too. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, pretty much everybody in this book, but I just wanted to... Including Anusha Ansari, you know, the first woman private yes. space explorer who's a big, wonderful part of the story and who spent 10 days at the International Space Station. Yeah. That would be neat. Yeah, she did get to travel well. to space, right? She did. She mm-hmm. did. And she had her dream realized, really. She helped Peter Diamandis realize his dream, and then he helped realize her dream of, of mm-hmm. getting to space. And... Um, so she, you know, she could, uh, she could kind of, you know, um, be a great, uh, great host and explain what what's out there since she's been there already. D- did Peter make it to space? Has has he been to space? No, but he has a ticket to fly on okay. Virgin Galactic, um, which is back to doing uh, more powered test flights of Spaceship Two and. Um, Actually, Professor um, Professor Hawking, Professor Stephen Hawking, also has a ticket to fly on Virgin Galactic, and he, you know, has a dream in his lifetime of of doing that in the you know next few years. Actually, as does Peter. Wow, I hope they they get to experience that. I mean, only a hand, you know, very few people have actually uh, done that. And um, I wanted to uh, one of my leave my last question would be, why should people become excited about space travel now? I think a number of reasons. I think it's about exploration. I think it's about bravery. And, um, you know, to many, there's the argument, what Elon Musk makes, that we need to back up the biosphere, quote-unquote, that we need to make sure that we have uh, backed up all the beauty, all the things we have here on uh, our little blue marble and back them up uh 
on another planet. In his view, that should be Mars. Um, so I think there's the dreamy exploration gene. I think there's the pragmatic sort of what can we achieve, uh, how far can we push the technology, and then there's the, uh, you know, this is what we will eventually need, uh, and that that sort of view. So I think it's all of that. I think it's all of those things. But I think that, you know, even if you're not interested in space, I think that, you know, it's really about big big dreams and figuring out a way to make them a reality. But there is so much exciting stuff going on right now with this private-public partnership um, between private industry and the government uh, in terms of space, space exploration, and what's next. So it's it's just, you know, it's exciting, and it's happening now. Mm-hmm. Okay, so before uh, we finish this interview, is there anything that you would like to add, Julian? Um, I just think that, uh, you know, this is, this, as I said, that this book, How to Make a Spaceship, is, you know, is about, uh, you know, shows that passion and persistence are probably more important than anything, and Peter Diamandis was told no, you know, more than 150 times in his quest to, you know, get someone to back this prize. He announces the prize without the $10 million, minor detail. He thought it was going to be easy to get the money and difficult to get the teams, and it proved extraordinarily difficult to get the money. Mm -hmm. Everybody said, why isn't NASA doing this, and what if someone dies? Um, So, you know, I think it's, it's this story of finding your passion and your purpose and then, uh, you know, finding a way to make it happen. So I think that's what I'd love to leave, uh, you know, listeners with, that that whether you're a space person or not, that this story has something for you um, to, to help you kind of achieve your dreams. And it's just a great slice of history, too. Again, that is very, very relevant today. And really fun characters, really amazing individuals and people who, in my mind, should be our you know, more of our role models today. Uh, And whether it's, you know, if you're thinking about STEM education or whether you're, you know, again, trying to do that moonshot, that crazy dream, Mm -hmm. um, here's kind of a roadmap for that. Okay. Well, Julian, I want to thank you for talking with us today. I found your book to be a lesson in perseverance, resilience, determination, and great over-the-top achievements. I wish you the best with your book. Oh, thank you for the great interview. Thank you, Julian. Uh, I just talked with Julian Guthrie on her new book, How to Make a Spaceship, A Band of Renegades, An Epic Race, and the Birth of Private Spaceflight. A great fast pace, page-turning read that narrates the race of getting the first private rocket to space, along with the very bold and courageous people who made it happen and keep making it possible. I'm your host, David Hinojosa. If you don't hear our regularly scheduled broadcast, you can always catch us on YouTube. The channel is Good Books Radio, Strong and Cook. Thank you for listening.